I moved from home about two years ago, but before then I was living in an old house with my family. No one believed me until there was evidence, but my family still lives in this house. It is placed next to an old church that is abandoned, so it was pretty creepy when we first bought it. The washer and dryer were in the basement, so ultimately I couldn't avoid it like I wanted to. It was always really creepy even when you were down there with someone else. It just felt like eyes were burning into you. There were some off happenings. There was food disappearing, doors would be left open that had been closed before, and clothes would be missing. There were also footsteps audible from the basement. So when I finally moved out, you can only imagine how happy I was. I need to tell you a little layout of the basement so that this will all make sense. There was a garage door and a normal door right next to it. The washer and dryer was the opposite of the door and the garage door. The stairs were right next to the doors, and there was one giant hole in the wall. My mom told me about what had been found in the hole in there about a month after I had moved out. There was a pile of old clothes and cotton matted down as though someone had been sleeping on it. There were also clothes that had been missing, empty food containers, and broken markers used as utensils. But the person grew ballsy and started taking forks, spoons, even actual plates. We figured they were getting in through the garage door since it had been broken and didn't lock. So to avoid it happening again, my stepdad boarded up the garage door. Flash forward about two months time. My mom was about to give birth to my little brother who's 20 years younger than me. Anyway, I was laying on the couch watching TV. My stepfather had boarded up the garage door like I said. I had then heard someone trying to yank open the garage door very violently. I wasn't really sure what was going on at first. So naturally, I was screaming because I didn't know what else to do. I called my stepfather and then I called the police and they searched around the house but they never found anything. I'd also like to add that the dryer wasn't on at the time, so it definitely wasn't that. After that night, we haven't really felt the same about the house, but we haven't had too much happen since. So, to end a long story, person who was creeping around my mom's basement that I never found out who you are, please stay away from us. For some context, I was 22 years old when this happened. I'm a female, and this happened when I was a senior in college. During my senior year in college, I was following a particular politician and was going to rallies and other events in my spare time. Me and my friends were having a ball and we absolutely loved being involved. One particular rally I went to was in the city. My friends and I took a train and we really enjoyed ourselves. On the way home back to our university, I noticed a guy that was sitting across from us that I had recognized from campus. He was pretty attractive, and I remember seeing him around as we must have had some mutual friends. I said hi to him, and to my delight, he also recognized me as well. We spoke for a few minutes and discovered we were both at the very same rally. By the end of the train ride, he asked me for my phone number. I remember thinking, wow, an attractive guy, and we have some things in common. I gave him my number, but I didn't really think much past that. About a week later, I received a text from him. He asked me if I was free this weekend and if I would be interested in meeting up and having a drink. This particular time was during a break from school, so there wasn't too many people around. For whatever reason, I had chose not to go home. In my naive mind at the time, I thought to myself, great, I have my place all to myself. I meet him at our local bar and we have a few drinks. It was pretty quiet for a Friday, as it was break time, and after about an hour or two, I decided to leave. I invited him back to my place for a bottle of wine and to hang out some more. He wound up staying the night and then leaving in the morning, but when I woke up, for whatever reason, I had this really uneasy feeling. Nothing bad had happened per se, I just didn't really like how things had went. I felt like he was so serious, 
not laughing or smiling the entire evening that we spent together. Although he always had a drink in his hands, I realized he wasn't really drinking them. The entire evening he was kind of shifty and nervous. The only way I can describe it is like he was on a mission and waiting for something. These were all red flags to me. I felt bad, but I was just not interested in this guy anymore. To my relief, he didn't text me for a while after that, and I assumed he came to the same realization that it just wasn't a good match. That is, until about two to three weeks later. He writes me a message telling me that he's been really busy, but that he wants to meet up this weekend and catch up with me. This particular weekend, my older sister was having a large party for her husband's birthday at their house and a few towns away. A few of my friends and I were going, and there was always a very large group of people at their parties, about 50 to 60 at least. Now, let me be clear, these parties were not your typical get wasted and stay up till the cops get caught type of college parties. They were more of an adult type party, given my sister's husband is fairly older than us. Don't get me wrong, there was plenty of drinking going on, and they were still very fun, just more of an adult-type barbecue with day drinking. Me and my two girlfriends were going to spend the night as I was going to drive there, but obviously we would be drinking. The party started early at around 12pm. Against my better judgment, I invited him to the party, thinking it couldn't hurt. I gave him the address and time. He seemed very interested and he agreed to come. The day of the party was actually a lot of fun and my friends and I were having a blast. I must admit though I did have a sinking feeling and I wasn't looking forward to seeing the guy. Then to my absolute and utter relief, I get a text from him saying he will be unable to make it. I could finally relax and enjoy the party. By about 12 a.m., Everyone is exhausted from a day of full-on drinking, and the party is now winding down. Most of all of the guests have gone home except for my friends and I, and a few other guys. Friends of my sister's husband who were also sleeping there. And of course, my sister and her husband. My sister has one guest room which was taken, and a fully carpeted and finished basement. We had various blankets and pillows, and we were all going to sleep down there on the couches, or pretty much anywhere that you could lay. As I'm about to go down to the basement and get ready for sleep, the man walks through the front door. No knocking, no text, no anything. Just confidently walks straight into the house. I don't know why, but my initial reaction was fear. I pretended to be happy to see him, and I gave him a small hug. I asked him why he was there, to which he never really gave me a real response. All of the lights were out, and everyone was gone. I was gesturing around and hinting at him that the party was over and that he had missed it. I felt really bad that he had made the effort and decided to speak with him for a few minutes before I went to bed. We talked. I told him I was going to get ready for bed and that I'm really sorry he missed the party. He then says, Yeah, it's fine. Well, this dude is just not getting the hint to leave. I leave the room and go to change out of my clothes and set myself up for bed, brush my teeth, etc. I'm just really hoping that he'll leave, but I don't hear any movement from the other room. When I come back to the living room to check and see if he's actually still there, well, he is, and he's asleep on the couch. I obviously found this strange, but just assumed it was late and that he must have been really tired. He didn't seem out of place, as there were various other people sleeping at the house as well. I went to the basement and found myself a place to sleep on the floor. About 30 minutes to an hour later, I'm lying on the floor still awake, thinking about how weird it is that he showed up. It's pitch black and there are a few other people sleeping there, including my friends. I hear someone in the dark slowly coming down the stairs. I see that they're holding a cell phone light to guide them. As the figure reached the bottom of the steps, I see that it's him. Now, he has never been to this house that is in a nice suburban area, and I did immediately think that it's weird that he would randomly be walking through a house of a person that he doesn't know. I pretended to be asleep. As I lay there frozen, I suddenly feel a tap on my shoulder. He doesn't say a word. 
He's over me and trying to wake me up. I don't move and I just pretend to be asleep. I lay there in the dark silence and I'm listening for his footsteps to walk away. I can tell that he's holding a light over me. Then, with no warning, this man takes a step back and with his boots on, kicks me full force in the face. I'm not talking about a little tap with his foot to wake me. No, full force boot kicks me directly in the face. My face goes numb. I don't know what just happened. I can feel blood running down my nose. I open my eyes and look at him, and all I can remember saying is something along the lines of, Why did you do that? He just stared at me blankly and didn't really say anything. Turned around and walked back up the steps. I just lay there paralyzed in fear. My heart is beating a million times a minute. I don't know how long it was until I garnished up the courage to get up, but eventually I army crawl in the dark over to my friend. There was another man that was near her who wakes up as well, and I explained what had happened. We're all half drunk, dazed and confused, to say the least. I can't stay in this basement. I know he left, but I was just so scared. My friend and the other guy offer to take me upstairs so I can sleep in my sister's room. I go into my sister's room and lay next to her bed on the floor. I shut the door right behind me, but unfortunately there was no lock. I don't know how, but eventually I finally fall asleep. At some point in the morning, I then wake up to my sister leaning over me. She asks, What happened to your face and why the heck are you in my room? Right as I'm about to answer her, my friend who had helped me the night before comes flying into the room. She then tells us that the guy is still there and he's asleep on the couch. She then runs out and I can hear her screaming at him to get up and get out. I hear him arguing back and asking where I am. My friend then tells him that I've left and then he begins arguing that he knows my car is still there, so he knows I haven't left. I have no idea how he knew which car was mine as he had never seen it before. He also mentioned that I hadn't taken my purse. Eventually though, he finally leaves. After that night, he wrote me a message a few days later as if nothing had happened, asking me to hang out yet again. I then blocked him, and after that, I never really heard from him ever again. I actually graduated only two months later, and thankfully, I never even saw him on campus again. To this day, I have no idea why he kicked me in the face and how he had the balls to stay after that. I have definitely learned my lesson about giving out my phone number. I still have no idea why he kicked me in the face and what the hell was wrong with him, but I just hope I never encounter him again. When I was around 8 years old, we moved into a new house. It wasn't old, but it wasn't a fairly new built house either, maybe built around the 60s. Everyone got their own room and this was the first time I was on my own. I thought I was a big shot. A little background. I'd like to call myself somewhat of a sensitive. Ever since I was a child, I could always feel the sense of something or someone around when no one else could. Fast forward to when I was nine. It was the first year in the house. I could feel the presence of something in there, but I never really thought anything of it considering it wasn't too negative. There were three rooms that I didn't really like being in because the energy felt somewhat dark. The basement, the bathroom, and the attic. I didn't really mind being in the basement whenever I had friends over, but whenever I was alone, I couldn't be in there for more than five minutes without getting the feeling like I was being watched. In the bathroom, there was a cabinet that was very deep. You could literally fit two grown men in there, and I never understood why it was so big to begin with. But it just didn't feel right, and I would often feel drawn to just go look inside and stare for a few minutes, and I would get a very uneasy feeling. The attic, on the other hand, was a different story. I never ever opened it. I kept the door shut at all times. Something was up there and it didn't want company. One night I was laying in bed, and it was around 2.45 a.m., 
when I heard footsteps in the hallway. I assumed it was just one of my brothers coming home from a night out with friends. My bedroom door was open, so I looked to see if anyone was rocking around. I stared for about what seemed like 10 minutes and no one went by. I got scared, so I decided to wait it out. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I thought I had seen a human-like shape in the corner of my bedroom. I thought it was just my eyes playing tricks on me, so I just tried to turn over and go back to sleep, but I felt like I was being watched. Now, in a nine-year-old's mind, it's the boogeyman, so I quickly hopped out of my bed and tried to run into my mom's room. Her room was only two doors down from mine, in order to walk out of my room, you have to pass a wall that was somewhat slanted. In order to do this, you have to walk sideways. As I did this, I felt two hands press down on my shoulders. I immediately froze in fear. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I was just a prisoner to my own body. Then all of a sudden, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. In my ear, clear as day, I heard heavy breathing, and it did not sound human. My eyes widened, and then I felt the pressure lift off of me, and I could move again. I ran so fast down the small hallway into my mother's bed. That whole night, I kept hearing someone walk back and forth in the hallway, but I absolutely refused to look through the doorway. When I tell you I didn't sleep that night, I mean, I didn't sleep that entire week. The next morning, I walked into the hallway and just so happened to look up. The door to the attic was wide open. I asked my mom was she up in the attic and she said no and that there was no reason that it should have been open. My stomach just felt like it was in my throat. I knew whatever was in that attic was in my bedroom the night before, just watching me. I'm thankful I got up and out of bed when I did, because if I didn't, I don't want to think what were to happen. I'm 22 years old now, and I can still remember that night as if it were yesterday, and I still can't sleep with the lights off. So, to whoever or whatever grabbed my shoulders that night, let's never, ever, and I mean ever, meet again. My dad's job requires him to go inside people's houses. He has been in thousands of apartments and houses, so I asked him what was the weirdest or creepiest thing that he's ever saw or experienced. My dad arrived early at this apartment complex around 7 a.m. because he had to go through every apartment doing some maintenance starting from the basement. He entered a laundry room located in the basement where there was a man around his 50s wearing a nice white shirt with a tie, suit pants, but no shoes, and he had a green tarp in his hands. He thought it was kind of weird, but just ignored it since it wasn't any of his business. Later that day, he left and went to a local coffee shop to spend his break, and when he came back to work there, there were police cars surrounding the area. Out of curiosity, he asked one of the police officers what was going on, and turns out, there was a homicide that had been committed. My dad then asked if what he saw was related to the crime. And boy, was it. After the police interrogation, they told him that the man without shoes stabbed his mother to death in his bathtub, wrapped her in a tarp, and then dragged her outside. The police actually caught him dragging his dead mother in the backyard. Of course, they didn't let my dad do this job in the murderer's apartment until after a proper investigation. A while goes by and dad gets to go there and finish what he was doing. He felt really uncomfortable doing plumbing and other maintenance in a house where someone got brutally murdered, especially in a bathroom with a bathtub full of dried up blood. Every time I tell this story to people, it always gives me the creeps. This happened to me about a week ago. I found a summer job at our local supermarket about two weeks in. I got asked to work the late night shift, 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. I accepted since I was pretty in need of money and I never went to sleep early anyways. Everything was fine and dandy until about 3 a.m. when a shirtless, scarred-up guy came into the store. After lingering around the store for a while, 
He quickly came up to the counter, making intense eye contact with me. As I was about to ask him if he needed any help, he then said to me, Don't you dare move. I couldn't really hear him at first, so I asked him if he could repeat that. At that point, he got agitated and then yelled, Make another sound and I'll slice you up. And in a very swift motion, he vaulted over the counter going to the alcohol section, trying to grab a bottle of whiskey. Thankfully, the owner has hit a baseball bat under the counter. The moment he turned his back to me, I took the bat and swung full force at his knee. He winced in pain and tried to get up. I held the bat up again, acting like I was going to hit him once more, just to see him pull out a homemade shiv of some sort. I let him get up, and the moment he got up, he swung his shiv at me, lightly lacerating my wrist. I pushed him back with my bat and ran out of the store and got out. The next day after, I decided to call the cops and show them the security footage, but they haven't contacted me since. I think it's safe to say that I won't be working the late night shift again for a really long time. It was just way too creepy for me. This happened a really long time ago, so my recollection of this isn't going to be word for word, but here goes. I'm a teenager and me and my mother live alone. We live basically in the middle of nowhere. The nearest town is a little less than an hour away, and the only things we have near us are a gas station and a bar. I know everyone who lives near me, and we rarely ever see new people in our neck of the woods. So, just seeing someone who isn't familiar is suspicious enough, so this was pretty creepy. A couple of years ago, it was the middle of the night, and me and my mother are night owls. We like to be awake from that midnight to 6 a.m. time period that most people prefer to be sleeping during. My mother was watching TV in the living room, and I was using the computer in the kitchen. The kitchen and the living room are basically connected, so I wasn't too far away from her, only a few feet. The front door leads right into the living room. It's a door with about nine windows, so it's pretty easy to see inside. My mom looked towards the door, and she said that she saw somebody staring at her through the window, and he was wearing a hood that obscured almost all of his face. My mom jumped, and she of course walked to the door and asked him what the heck he was doing. According to my mother, he looked pretty young, but she could barely see his face, so who really knows how old he was? The man said something along the lines of, Uh, could you please help me with my car? in a tone that I can only describe as miserable and very off-putting. Even though it was dark out, there should have been enough light for her to see a car, but there was no car. The man was also holding his hands in his pockets pretty tight. My mother said no, but that she was sorry she couldn't help. This caused him to grip whatever it was in his pockets even tighter, so tight that it caused his arms to tremble. He stayed for a few more minutes, and then it swiftly disappeared. Throughout the night, maybe one or two hours later, we thought that we had heard some slight weeping, but we didn't see anyone at any of our doors or windows. I might just be making assumptions here, but I can only assume it was a weapon that he was holding in his pockets. This was a really creepy experience, and it's safe to say he was probably going to lure my mother out of the house so he could do something sinister to her. About a year ago, there was a very small metal plate jammed between the front door strike plate and the piece that goes inside of it. I'm not really sure what it's called. We have zero idea where this metal plate came from, but the metal plate stopped our doors from locking, so I'm assuming it was put there so that somebody could get in later. These two situations are probably not related, but in hindsight, it's really made me think about them because this was deliberately placed there by somebody, and we're not really sure why. Anyway, I'm just really glad we ended up being okay and nothing bad actually happened, but it's still pretty creepy. I lived alone on the fourth floor of an on-campus apartment building when I was in college. Early one morning, around 3 a.m., I was awakened by a knock at my door. I got up half asleep and went to the door and peeked out of the peephole. There was a large guy standing on the other side of my door. 
I'd lived in the building for a while, and I knew my neighbors pretty well, but this guy was unfamiliar to me. I didn't open the door, but called out to the guy in the hall. What do you want? I need to use your phone. He answered. Dude, what? It's like 3 a.m. I told him. Yeah, I know. My car is broke down outside. I need to use your phone. The guy said. I was still pretty blurry-eyed and foggy-headed, but something just seemed so weird about this guy, so I refused to open the door. The guy got frustrated saying he was in need and I was not being neighborly and nice. I still refused to open the door and then he started insulting me. Finally, after repeated refusals to open the door, he then left and I went back to bed. I didn't really think much of it until the next day when I was sitting in class going over the whole event in my head. It really struck me as very odd that this guy would choose my apartment to go to and ask for help. After all, I lived on the fourth floor in the middle of the hall. He didn't knock on any of the other doors, just mine. When he left my apartment, he didn't try any of the other neighbors. He just left the building. I realized at that moment that he had likely targeted me. If I had lived on the first floor near the doors, I might have let it go, but on the fourth? He had gone up four flights of stairs and halfway down the hall just to ask to use my phone? Yeah, right. The thought alone put a cold lump in my stomach, especially when I started to remember that there was a payphone in the lobby of the building. Even now... I get chills whenever I think about what might have happened if I had opened my door. I honestly almost did because around that age I always wanted to be liked. Fortunately my gut instinct won out and I'm here to tell the tale. Thank God nothing happened. So this happened in April of this year, 2018. Background. I live in a major city in Texas. My apartment complex is gated and in a good neighborhood, but the security isn't extremely tight. Sometimes the gates are left open and anyone could piggyback off of someone else entering with the access code. Maybe twice in the past three years, the management has put out notices of vehicle break-ins or other items being stolen from porches. We also have frequent door-to-door -door solicitors, even though there are signs forbidding it. Okay, so this particular Friday evening, I go to bed about 2.30 a.m. For some odd reason, I was having trouble getting to sleep, so I put on a podcast to listen to and eventually start to doze off. I become aware of a noise that sounds like a clicking sound, but it sounds like one of my upstairs neighbors making some noise. I kind of zone this out as I'm used to my neighbors staying up late on weekends. After about 30 seconds, I realize the noise is extremely repetitive and getting louder. I then start focusing on it more intently, trying to isolate what it could be and where it is coming from. Suddenly it hits me. It's coming from the entrance to my apartment. I leap out of bed and head to the foyer. I identify the noise right away. The lock mechanism is moving back and forth rapidly, like someone is trying to unlock the front door. I can hear that an object is inserted in the lock and the person is jimmying it back and forth with a lot of force. I instinctively turn around and head to my bedside safe, unlock it with the combination, pull out my 357 SIG pistol, load a 14 round magazine and chamber a hollow point round. I head back to the door and as I exit the bedroom, I see the lock twist and unlatch. I immediately pointed my weapon straight ahead, knowing that if someone comes through, I will have to make a split second reaction. I decide that if someone comes through the door, I will give them a momentary chance to retreat. But if they do anything other than that, or enter aggressively, I'm going to shoot and ask questions later. They don't enter, however, because I had also locked the deadbolt inside only. When I first moved in a year prior, I remember thinking that the deadbolt was a great security feature, and I got in the habit of always keeping it locked when I'm home. In hindsight, this decision saved me from a life or death confrontation. Upon realizing that, I approach the door and look through the keyhole. On the other side are three Asians, two men and one woman. 
All three are wearing hoodies, so it's difficult to make out their faces. The men have objects in their hands. I can't make out exactly what. The two men are talking back and forth, probably trying to figure out why they can't open the door, even though they have successfully opened the outside lock at this point. The woman is also talking loudly, behind the two men, such that anyone in the hallway would be able to hear her voice. She's talking in another language. The only words I can make out are blah 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 apartment 250 blah blah blah, and she keeps repeating that over and over like a broken record. Upon hearing that, I start to wonder for a moment if maybe they're just drunk and have the wrong apartment number. But that's impossible. To open my lock, they would have to have a copy of my exact key, or some kind of lock picking device. I've never copied my key or given it to anyone. Here's the other thing, not only is 250 not my apartment number, but as I figured out later, that apartment number doesn't exist anywhere in the complex. Standing back from the door, I take a long broom handle and jab it hard into the face of the door, letting them know that I'm on the other side. They immediately stop fiddling with the lock and take off running. I debate whether to call 911 and decide against it, unless they return. I know they'll be long gone by the time anyone gets here. It would be too risky to follow them to try and get a better description or license plate. And I don't have enough identifying info as it is to make an arrest. I filed a police report the next day and let the apartment manager know. They said it was unusual, but they would alert the resource officer and ask for a police presence for a couple of nights. Nothing ever came of that report, but that's not a surprise to me. It's been seven months since this happened, and no further incidents. Nobody else in the apartment has reported anything similar happening. I don't think they'll be back, but one precaution I took was to buy a smart lock for the deadbolt, so I can leave that deadbolt always locked from the inside, even when I'm not home. It's crazy to think that the deadbolt was the only thing between myself and an armed confrontation with intruders. They say you don't really know what you'll do in those situations until it really happens, but I can honestly say I am proud of how I stayed calm and was mentally prepared to defend myself. If there's one good thing that came out of this, I feel confident that I responded the right way and was ready for the unthinkable. So 3am burglars and your female accomplice, let's not meet again. And for your own sake, please find a safer way to make a living. There's nothing in my apartment worth dying for. Last night, my wife and I made a typical trip to our local Walmart. Generally, we go between 1 and 3 a.m. I'm a night owl by nature and have a long-standing aversion to busy stores during the day. Long story involving a holdup. Our local Walmart, which is on the access road of a major interstate highway, is the newest in our area and generally considered safe. A few notes to start off with. The particular area of Texas that my wife and I live in is commonly known for being an area frequented by sex traffickers. It's so bad that the city has put up billboards about sex trafficking since our county recently had a large prostitution bust involving women who were victims of sex trafficking and johns with occupations ranging from local pastor, deputy sheriff, elected officials of the city council, big business owners, and one of my clients that is now a former client since he got himself involved with that crap. There's a particular area of our town that most know not to venture to at night, especially if you're a female. Ironically, this bad area is adjacent to a large university. However, my wife and I live in the suburbs on the south side of town, which is generally considered safe and is well patrolled by the local police department. We have two Walmarts in town, one in the bad area and a new one built in our suburb. The Walmart we went to last night is the new one located a couple miles from our house. Also, my wife is 27, but looks around 19 or 20. She's an attorney that teaches deadly force, castle doctrine, situational awareness, and handgun safety to women throughout our area. She's been involved in martial arts since she was five, has a license to carry a handgun, and routinely carries a SIG Mark 25 in her purse. In short, She's well-trained for detecting dicey situations. 
My wife drove our truck to Walmart, and I sat in the back working on correcting an issue with one of my mobile radios. I'm a ham radio operator. She parked in a well-lit area near the 24-hour entrance as usual. As typical for the hours we go to Walmart, the parking lot was mostly empty, except for the employees who parked near the same entrance. As soon as my wife put the truck in park, a newer gray Kia SUV pulled in sideways, almost blocking my wife from driving any forward any further. A woman in her late 20s, looking like she was under the influence of drugs, stared at my wife for a few seconds, got out of the SUV, ran over to the driver's side window, and started knocking on the window. My wife, being skeptical of any encounter like this, barely cracked the window to see what the woman wanted. Here's what occurred. I need your help. That man over there needs a jump and I'm afraid to go by myself. We don't have any jumper cables. However, I'll call the police for you if you're afraid. No, no, I need your help. It'll be quick. I just need your help for a few minutes. Does that man have jumper cables? How do you know him? I'm just trying to make sure you're not going into a dangerous situation yourself. Oh, he's got jumper cables. I just need your help now. Apparently, the crazy woman didn't notice me in the back seat, so I figured it was time to make my presence known. My wife told you we'll call the police for you. We'll be happy to wait here in this area until they get here. For our safety and yours, please get back in your car and wait. No, fuck you. I don't need a damn man involved. Women need to stick together. Come on, honey. I'm scared and I need your help. I'd help you out if you were in the same situation. I'm not going anywhere with you. I don't know you, and I'm certainly not walking into a situation that I know sounds like a setup. You don't understand. I just need you to make sure that I'm safe while he jumps his car. I need you over there now. There's a man, one row over, that parked right around the same time as us. Why didn't you ask him for help? I need your help. I called the police, let them know what was going on, and told them we needed an officer ASAP. My wife rolled up the window, but the crazy woman kept standing around our truck screaming and pointing for my wife to roll down the window again. Sick of this crap, and probably against my better judgment, I got out of the truck and told the woman in a few colorful phrases where she could go if she didn't leave us alone. The crazy woman ran back to her SUV and sped off toward the dark, unlit area of the parking lot where the newer Honda Accord was parked. I got back in the truck and told my wife to lock the doors again and be ready to get the hell out of there if the man and woman start heading our way. While we were waiting for the police, I observed the woman park next to the Honda, roll down her window, and start talking to the man. It was apparent they were in a heated argument, but we were too far away to hear the contents of the conversation. At no point did either of them make an attempt to jumpstart the Honda. In fact, I never saw the man get out of the Honda. A couple minutes later, a police officer showed up. I flagged him down, told him what happened, and pointed out where the man and woman were parked. As soon as the first police officer started driving toward the dark area of the parking lot, the woman screeched the tires on her SUV and started hauling toward the other entrance to the parking lot. Around the same time, the Honda that was supposedly dead magically turned on. Fortunately, another police officer was turning at the entrance and was able to stop the woman. A third officer arrived shortly afterwards. My wife and I went into Walmart, did our shopping, and came out about 20 minutes later. When we got back to our truck, both the Kia and Honda were getting towed by a tow company known to work with the local police department. I'm not sure exactly what went down, but I assume that both the man and woman were arrested. If the woman's behavior was any indication, she was heavily under the influence of drugs and likely had some either on her person or in the SUV. Later I asked my wife what she would have done if the crazy woman would have approached her while we were walking and made an attempt to pull my wife towards the SUV. Her response? I'd have knocked the crap out of her. When I was around 15 years old, my friend invited me into this kick group chat with people that I was dying to know. Hackers, modders, and people who explored the deep web and would send my friend obscure videos from there. I actually idolized these 10 or so guys. 
there were a couple of guys with their own things that they would send. One guy would send in weird anime and manga, some obscure and some funny, and some also horrifying and graphic. Another would send in weird videos and memes off the deep web, according to him anyways. But there was one guy who would send in random clips of porn and not really say much of anything else. His profile picture was of an Indian man, I would say around in his 20s. Anyways, when I say nothing phased the people in this group chat, I mean nothing phased anyone. Snuff videos, gory anime and manga, scary videos and meme and the like were all taken in stride and oftentimes laughed at. But one day, the porn guy sends in a video that I didn't even bother clicking on because I knew it was just another dumb porn video. That is, until people in the group chat sent in a barrage of, Dude, what the hell? Are you serious? Suddenly, porn guy is removed from the group chat, and people were warning others not to watch the video, and that it was literally child pornography. My teenage curiosity got the best of me, and, well, I clicked on the video. I won't be too graphic, but if this kind of stuff triggers you, stop listening to this immediately. The video consisted of an 11 or 12 year old, possibly of Asian descent, sitting on a toilet in a dingy old bathroom and casually giving oral sex to an older man from his point of view with a phone camera. The group chat died shortly after this. I'm not really sure if that was the porn guy in the video or just a video that he stumbled across, but either way, I wasn't the same for a long time after seeing that video. I really hope wherever that little girl is today, she's okay and away from that sick man. Please everyone, be careful out there. Even on the internet, there's so many dangerous things that you can come across. Please be careful. Ask FM was a website where people can ask you questions either anonymously or not, which you can answer on your public profile for everyone to see. When the website was gaining popularity, I was pretty active on there from when I was around 13 to 15 years old. All was good and well. I made quite a few friends that I'm still in contact with now at 22, and I had lots of fun. I Skyped with most of these friends on the regular, and I even went to a concert in Berlin with one of them in around 2013. It was amazing. That is, until I started getting weird questions and messages from a new account concerning my fear of clowns, which I had only talked about privately after answering one of the questions months ago and then deleting it shortly after. The account had a clown profile pic and a username which referenced my name and sent loads of questions and messages containing personal information that I never disclosed on my profile. At first, I just kind of thought it was a tasteless prank from a dude I was kind of friends with, but it wasn't. I was really annoyed and announced that I'd leave Ask for a few weeks because I was no longer comfortable logging in and seeing these messages. Soon afterwards, my friends texted me about the weird messages that they had received from my profile. I changed my password after realizing my account had been hacked and then apologized to the people for the weird stuff that they had gotten from my account. Immediately, the clown profile then sent me messages saying he'd leave my ask profile alone if I accepted his request on Skype, but I wasn't using Skype regularly anymore. I declined and after not hearing from him for a few days, I thought that was it. When I logged into Skype the next time though, I suddenly had five new accounts and my contacts that had all messaged me telling me to reply or else. Of course, all of them had clown profile pics and I told him to leave me alone. I wasn't interested in having any form of contact with him. He then sent me screenshots of him texting with my friend from Berlin about meeting up sometime and told me that if I really valued her, I would message him back whenever he messaged me on Skype or ask. I was extremely weirded out and scared at this point and then deleted my ask account, but I never even thought about going to the police because I was just a 14 year old girl at this point and what would the police even do about it? Clown dude made a new account in my name with my picture and everything, talking weird crap again, posting weirdly edited versions of my profile pics and everything. So at this point I'm just like screw it, 
I don't care anymore. I let him do his thing and then deleted his accounts from my Skype contacts. He hacked back into my account and then accepted his requests a few times though. I made a new account and added my friends on there, but still use my old account like once a week just to keep this guy at bay basically. I was still super scared and confused, but I was just like, whatever. He's just a stupid internet Rambo trying to harass young girls into talking to him. Just ignore him and gradually stop replying. Surely he'll go away. That went pretty well until he posted a Google Maps screenshot of my house on Ask, and then a friend asked me if it was really my house. And for sure, it was. I was absolutely terrified, and I didn't know what to do. So I just never really did anything and just kind of sat it out. A friend of a friend of mine somehow found out that he lived somewhere in Germany, so not even that far from me, and that scared me even more. But after months of this, this was apparently the peak of harassment, and it all just stopped. The Ask account was deleted, and I never got any Skype messages from him ever again, and it was finally over. I checked for months after whether he was back or anything, but I never heard anything from this guy again. But to this day, I still have no idea who he was or why he was doing this to me. Please, I repeat, be careful on the internet. I'm a 14 year old female, and I was on a Discord server. It was a very feminine server with mostly girls and a few guys. Mostly gay though. That's where I met the predator of our story. He was working for someone to make an art commission for him that he would pay in Robux. It was also a Roblox server. I decided to volunteer since I was pretty broke, and I thought to myself, hey, my art is pretty decent, so we then DM'd each other about it. I finished and he pays me. We keep talking for a few months and now I consider him a really great friend. I realize now looking back on it though, that he was grooming me. For a while we stopped talking and then I DM'd him again asking if he wanted another art commission. He asked for a picture of me, and I sent one. He said that I was very beautiful and stunning. I don't really remember how it happened, but he ended up manipulating me into sending him inappropriate pictures of me for Robux. That night, I cried myself to sleep. I was in a very vulnerable state at the time, and I had lost someone that I had been really close with. All the stuff he was doing took a toll on my mental health and other things. He continued asking me for photos and videos of me doing vulgar things to myself and for the camera. It actually got to the point where I just wanted to die. I tried to stop and I told other people to spread the word about him on Discord, but there was a problem. He found out about this and then he threatened me, saying that if I told anyone he would expose my photos and other things in his YouTube channel and I was scared that I couldn't tell anyone. This guy actually had around 70,000 subscribers. I felt like I was trapped in a bubble of water with no way out. After about a month, it had finally settled down and ended, or so I thought. My mom went through my phone and she saw the things that he said to me. I was victim shamed and I told my mom that I wanted to die. It was rough. A few months later, I ended up in a mental hospital for intent to kill myself. It really helped me through this. I'm finally on the meds that I needed and I'm slowly getting better now. I then blocked him and all of the people he was friends with on every social media my mom didn't delete. And that's the story for now. I'm honestly doing much better now, but this really did take a toll on me and my mental health. I met this guy online about 8 years ago now, on an online avatar chat simulator type thing called MVU. Even back then, it was mostly used by children lying about their age and creepy older people looking to get it on in the virtual space. My best friend Jasmine and I actively used this app slash game or whatever you want to call it when we were both about 14 years old. 
I met this man by random chance, as MVU used to have a feature where you could be connected to a random stranger to chat with. I don't really remember too much about our first meeting other than he was very calm and collected, as well as extremely suave and charming. He told me his name was Wesley, and I introduced myself and we established that we live very close to one another, just a few towns away. He told me he was 20 and I told him I was 18. He obviously knew that was a lie. I offered to introduce him to Jasmine, as we talked about and shared everything at the time, and he was very excited by this. Jasmine also claimed to be 18. The three of us chatted for a bit in cyberspace, but quickly our new friend proposed that we all get in a three-way call together on the phone. Jasmine and I were already on the phone together as we were chatting with Wesley, and I remember us both squealing like the little teenage girls that we were. We were both very charmed by this mysterious older man who was making very flirtatious comments at us both, and we quickly dialed him into our call. The three of us talked for quite a few hours that night. If it wasn't completely obvious to him that we were not 18 before then, it would have become abundantly clear then. But still, he continued making flirtatious comments directed at the both of us, and we were smitten. Jasmine and I were not the most popular or conventionally attractive kids, so we really ate up all of the attention. Fast forward to some time later. Jasmine and I are both frequently talking to this guy, both together and while apart. We'd migrated to Skype for chatting, no video calling though, and we still frequently did our three-way phone calls. Jasmine and I were getting kind of competitive over this guy, as we both really liked him quite a lot and we started occasionally fighting over who would have him. We sent him a photo of the two of us together in it. Again, further cementing to him that we were obviously way underage, and we'd received a photo of him as well. He was very skinny, had long black curly hair, looked very greasy, and was wearing sunglasses inside. Wesley was still making inappropriate comments towards us both, but it never crossed a line, that is, until one fateful night. Jasmine needed to go to bed and she left our three-way phone call, so Wesley and I were left all alone. Wesley made a comment towards me saying that he always thought I was prettier than Jasmine, but to never tell her that. This made me feel like I was victorious in this weird little battle Jasmine and I were waging, but the compliment came with a condition. The way he'd worded it was basically that he knew I was better than Jasmine because he knew that I would do things with him that Jasmine was too afraid to do sexual things. Me being a very try-hard teenager who was trying to one-up my friend, of course said yes to this. That was the first night that he coerced me into having phone sex with him. Later on, I found out that he'd actually approached Jasmine with this proposition first, and she also complied but didn't tell me about it until a while after. One-on-one -on -one phone sex with us both, then one day, a few weeks later, turned into a three-way phone sex with both of us. After that point, he approached us both together and asked if we would both be his. Which was a compromise. No more fighting. We'd share him. We agreed and after we did, things only grew more hostile between Jasmine and I behind the scenes. But in front of him, he told us we needed to behave. As time went on and we'd become more acquainted with one another sexually, his requests and demands of the two of us started growing more perverted, vulgar, and absolutely disgusting. With the two of us now together, he'd start delving into BDSM and violence, talking about beating us. With me privately, he started talking to me about incest and trying to coerce girls younger than me to be his slaves. Jasmine told me that privately he'd talk to her about bestiality, like trying to have her do things with animals and kidnapping her. We were both very scared at this point, with it no longer really being fun for either of us. But Wesley was constantly assuring the both of us privately that we were his favorite, and that made us both continue, trying to one-up the other and win the prize. All of this eventually built up to the day that Wesley told Jasmine and I that he was coming through our town on business. I don't think he ever really told either of us what he did for a living just that it involved him constantly driving along the east coast of our state. Wesley was determined to meet with the both of us. 
Me having a very strict father who didn't even let me go to the mall for an hour without a chaperone or on school supervised trips, I just knew that I would never be able to make that happen. My dad would ask way too many questions about it. Jasmine, however, lived alone with her mom, who typically didn't really care where she was at any point. My fear of my dad was enough to trump even this guy's persuasion. But Jasmine, well, she eventually agreed to go and meet this guy. Part of me was scared for her, and part of me was really jealous. I knew this would mean that she won our battle, but part of me was okay with that. Thinking back on it, not meeting up with him is possibly one of the best choices I ever made. Jasmine to this day is so traumatized by what happened to her that day. To this day, she still hasn't revealed all of the details to me. Bringing it up or talking about it makes her go into a panic attack. What she did tell me was that the two of them met at a local chain restaurant. He took her to some apartment, and she was there with him for 10 hours, trapped until he eventually got bored with her and took her home. She absolutely insists that she wasn't raped, but I just don't know if I fully believe her. All I know is that he did things to her that she won't speak of, and we share everything with one another. I don't know why she never called the cops. I don't know why I never called the cops. She never got the license plate number or anything either. I think we were both just so scared of getting caught by our parents and getting in trouble that the idea of calling the police was just out of the question for us both. I know, stupid. After Jasmine's encounter with Wesley, neither of us ever spoke to him ever again. Not on MVU, Skype, or the phone. The prospect that he knew her home address scared us both, but as far as we know, he never showed up there. Fast forward four years later, making me about 18 years old now. Neither Jasmine or I have talked to Wesley in years. I still would think about him and what happened to Jasmine pretty frequently. She and I were both pretty traumatized, especially her, and were the only two that knew about this man and his actions. Then one day, my mom came home from the dollar store and she told me that she'd met a man there who said he knew me. For reference, my mom has very early onset dementia, and at this point she was not thinking or acting as clearly as she could have been. He talked to her while she was checking out and helped her put away her things into her car. I was kind of confused, not really knowing who it could have been at first. Then she said, he said that his name was Wesley. And I froze. My heart felt like it was absolutely going to explode. She then described him to me, and it sounded like it could have been him, but she said that he had shorter hair and a beard. I had only ever known one person in my life named Wesley at this point. But still, I held on to hope that it wasn't him. I asked her if he said where he knew me from, and she said she didn't ask, but that he'd said we were old friends. I pressed her with questions very frantically, and she said she was very confused by them. Apparently, he'd helped her put her groceries in the car while talking about me in my schooling, and then he said goodbye to her, and she left. I then asked my mom if she knew how he knew her as my mom. Again... She said she didn't ask. I don't know how this man was able to identify my mother or why he was in my town. I don't know why so many years later, he's not only still interested in me, but interested enough in me to know who my mother was without me ever sending him a photo of my mom or telling him anything about her. I can only imagine that he must have been stalking me or her, but I don't really know how. I really hope he didn't have my home address, but considering that I lived in an area that was very off in the middle of nowhere, I don't really know if he did. After my mom disclosed what school I went to, I wonder if he'd ever showed up there. I wonder if he got my mom's license plate number that day. Jasmine was still living in that same house he dropped her off at that night, even then. I wonder if he'd paid her house any visits. I wonder if he ever saw us together. As it currently stands, I've never seen him, and Jasmine's never seen him since the day they met up, and my mom never saw him again after that day at the store. Even after that encounter, I was too paralyzed with fear of what my dad would do to me to tell anyone about him, even though I knew that my family and I could be in great danger. I know, I'm an absolute fool for this. It's way too late now, I think, and I really regret not doing anything every day of my life. It's one of my life's biggest regrets. 
even if I wanted to try and do something later on, I don't actually know what could have been done. I think if he was stalking me, he's probably given up by now. I've moved houses several times since then, and now live in a different city. Jasmine also lives in a different city now as well. Still though, even now, every time I see a car parked way too close to me, or a guy that resembles how he looked, I just freeze and I start to wonder. I can't even hear the name Wesley or his last name without getting flashbacks. I don't know whatever happened to him. I don't know what he did to my best friend. I don't know how he managed to find my mom four years later. And I honestly don't know how I'm still safe. But thank God I am. Wesley, wherever you are, I really pray and hope you never do what you did to me and my friend to any other young girls. You're one very sick individual. There is this hotel at the Bulgarian seaside in which we have an apartment. To be honest, that's kind of a strong word for it because it's really just a big room with a giant bed, refrigerator, big windows on both of the walls, and a really small bathroom. It's on a ground floor and again, both of the walls are facing the parking lot of the hotel. Despite all that, it's perfect for me alone. It's right next to the beach and that's why I've been spending some of my summer vacations there. So around July about three years ago, I'm spending a week with my ex-boyfriend there and about three to four weeks alone after that. My ex always said that the owners of the hotel were a bunch of creeps. Whenever we went out of the room, we had to walk a path passing through the reception where they used to sit all day doing absolutely nothing. The old dad, I believe, was around 60 years old, and his son around 40, his daughter around 45, and her husband as well. Whenever you would pass, they would all get silent and just stare at you. Every freaking time. I was used to it already, but the boyfriend was irritated, especially when he caught the son staring at my butt, smiling. After that, he used to just stare him down very deadly, right in the eye whenever he got a chance. So my ex goes back to the city and now it's the third week that I've been alone and the night is really hot so I decided to open up both of my windows wide open and put the curtains above them. I did this to defend myself from being peeked at. After all, I'm at ground level and my bed is right below both of the windows. I wake up in the middle of the night and I just feel like someone's watching me. This continues to happen the next few nights. I'm very easily scared and paranoid, but I was alone there, so I've been telling myself to chill and that it's just my crazy mind trying to scare itself. Some nights went by without problem. Meanwhile, the crummy son tried to talk with me two to three times when I'm off at the beach. So, it's around 1am and I'm falling asleep, and I hear footsteps outside the path. It's not really strange, there's some people next to me staying at the same kind of apartment. Maybe someone's coming home or going out partying. But the steps stop at one point, really close outside. I hear all of it because of the open windows. I'm sitting on the bed now and listening, when I notice the freaking door handle is moving slowly up and down. I kind of lost my crap but stayed quiet and I was really proud of myself for locking the door. After that, nothing really happened and whoever the person was just walked away. I closed the windows, called my dad and then told him what had just happened. He told me to lock and close everything and that he would take me in the morning. Mind you, it's a five hour drive. This was three years ago. Last night we're all having a dinner and my dad is like, do you remember your sea adventures? And he then proceeds to tell me that he made his own little investigation back in the day, and he asked the owners of the hotel for security camera records. They check the ones at the parking lot and see a male figure walking around. The part with the door handle wasn't in the camera's range though. My dad then remembers of my strange midnight waking up routine and tells them to check the older records, in which they all see a man getting at my window and peeking through the curtains standing like that for about 15 to 20 minutes. The woman finally recognized the man as her brother 
and then told my dad that he has mental disabilities and begged him not to press any charges and they'll take better care of him and look after him. So, the good guy that my dad was decided not to press any charges. But even to this day, it still gives me the creeps. When I was about 12 years old, I lived with my mom and brother in a hotel room. We were trying to get back on our feet after leaving my abusive father. The place was the only hotel in our small town that would allow us to live there on a long-term basis. It was a really creepy building from the early 20th with insanely unsanitary showers and walls covered with old wallpaper made of thick fabric. Everything was beige with flowery patterns and covered with mold. Our room actually had a rotary phone hooked to the wall next to the master bed, which had the most terrible loudest ringtone. Think regular rotary phone from hell multiplied by the fact that the hotel was always silent, humid, and echoey. We hadn't received many calls on this phone as we were hiding our whereabouts, telling reception to say there weren't guests under our name, etc. Once, though, they had patched through social services, which probably were the only people to call there. Reception checked with us first, though, to see if it was okay. We were pretty scared at the time and extremely on edge. My best friend actually hung out a few times, which made me feel a little better. We had a crush on the cute 30-something daytime receptionist, which in hindsight, he really wasn't that cute thinking back. Just an older man with hair. But teenager us were all over the place. Thankfully, he was ignoring us and didn't understand he was the object of the giggling. One afternoon, I was reading in the room all on my own. My mom had found a job and she was due to be back in a couple of hours, and my brother was at after school care. I had been there for a couple of hours undisturbed when the phone rang. Once I recovered from the cardiac arrest, I picked up. Good afternoon. Are you Sarah? Um, yeah. So, you're an attendant of the Friday dance class at the sports center, right? We're doing a study, and I'd really like to ask you a couple of questions. I wasn't going to go back to that dance class, but I got really anxious and irrational about it being a weirdly intricate plot from my father just to know where we lived. So I played along. Yes, okay. Okay, so when you dance... Afterwards, do you change? Change? Change what? Come on, you know. Change clothes afterwards, when you're all sweaty. You do get sweaty, right? Um, I don't change. There aren't showers in the sports center, so I just go home. And you shower? Then there's this really long silence. Yes, I shower. So, what kind of things do you wear? Like panties? I then hung up and I crawled away from the phone frantically because I didn't want it to ring directly into my ear and kill me in case he called again. Then I took my coat and went to hang out at the department store until it was almost time for my mom to get home. It was as if the phone was this thing to get away from. And then I just forgot all about it. I guess I had too many problems to deal with at the time, so perhaps it didn't really seem particularly alarming but it still gave me the absolute creeps. Years later, the memory came back to me when I heard a very similar ringtone from hell. For some reason, one thing struck me immediately when I hadn't really zeroed in on it when it happened. The call had come through immediately without me speaking to reception first or hearing the click of them transferring the call. We stayed a few months after that and we used the phone a bit more. Plus, at that point, no one knew we lived there except for social services as my mom confirmed since then. I also asked specifically if the sports center did. They didn't. In other words, the caller was sitting at the reception desk. Now, I don't really remember who was sitting at the desk when I ran out a bit later. What I do remember, however, is staying in that hotel for a few months and not seeing the cute receptionist again. Yet, as per the warning, this is a very mild story. So I've really been wondering quite a lot about what else he was doing that would have come to light if I had figured it out and complained. I guess I'll never really know though. And again, I know this story is pretty mild compared to what most of you have read about. 
but still, it still really gives me the creeps whenever I think about it. This happened early this week, and it still freaks me out. I work at a hotel in my hometown and was driving my husband's truck into work as he was taking mine to the shop to get serviced. He has a very large truck, and I only drive it when I absolutely have to. When I pull into the side parking lot, I notice the entire lot is covered in snow, and no one can see the lines for the spots. So I begin looking like a moron and try to park in what I hope is a spot, backing up and moving forward several times. When I finally park, I get out of the truck and grab my backpack when I hear someone yelling from the sidewalk from behind the parking lot. Hey, you need to learn how to freaking park! I'm embarrassed, but just close the truck, lock it, and begin walking to the front of the building. Now the hotel has a side entrance for employees, but it takes a code, and I have a shitty memory so I just walk to the front and go through the main entrance. I hear the guy yelling again. Do you hear me, idiot? I walk faster and take a peek behind me. The guy is following me. I keep walking but call back. Please, leave me alone, I need to get to work. Before I can reach the corner of the building and make my way to the entrance, the guy grabs my arm and spins me around. I'll never forget what this guy looked like for as long as I live. He wore dark clothes with a torn up winter coat. His eyes were bloodshot and he smelled like a combination of cigarettes and whiskey. I guess he must have been drunk, but he didn't slur at all when speaking. You're coming with me. The guy began dragging me back to the truck and I tried to pull my arm away from him. Let go of me. Give me the keys, we're taking a drive. I begin to yell for help and his grip on my arm got tighter. I'm a 26 year old woman, not skinny but a lot smaller than this guy. He was dragging me easily and the snow on the ground just made my feet slide along the ground. Someone help, please. No one was near us and I keep fighting to get away from this guy. I prayed that there would be guests that could possibly hear me, but it was our slow season so most likely there was no one in the rooms on that side of the building. The guy turns back to glare at me. Shut the hell up and give me the keys! Now I was carrying my backpack on one shoulder as it was big and bulky from my uniform and shoes. I quickly slipped the strap down my arm, grabbed it and swung it right into his face. The guy let go of me and I just ran for my life to the front doors. I heard the guy screaming but I ignored him. I was way too scared to look back at him. I ran inside and all the way to the employee locker rooms. When I finally calmed down enough I went to the front desk to talk to security. Sadly, there were no cameras on that side of the building, so nothing was recorded. They called the cops and I made a report. The cops informed the general manager of the hotel that they needed to seriously consider security cameras on that side of the building, as drunks and druggies were known to be in this area. They got the description of the guy and said they would keep an eye out for him. The manager apologized like crazy about the incident, but I told him it wasn't his fault. He is a really good guy. I did ask the security guard to follow me out so I could check on the truck. Thankfully, it was fine. The security guard promised to make more rounds outside, especially that early in the morning. If there's an update, I'll post it here. Creepy kidnapper. Let's not meet again. This primarily happened to my mom, but this has badly affected me as well. She wanted me to post this just to give people a heads up that you can encounter creeps literally anywhere so always watch your back. This happened last month, and we still don't actually know what happened with Jeremy in the end. I'm a 19-year-old female who was studying in a university in England, entering my second year last month. We decided to stay in my university town the day before that I was due to move in my student home so I could get there early and move my stuff in and give me the rest of the day to relax before we started Freshers' Week. The night before moving day, me and my mother stayed in a hotel located in my university town. We were greeted by a very friendly man called Jeremy. Jeremy was very attentive and showed us to our room and stayed around 10 minutes telling us the history of the hotel. And he repeatedly asked us if we needed help unpacking and stuff, which we kindly rejected. It was a Friday. So, me and my mother went around the town and had a few drinks. Before going out, Jeremy explained that he never works on the weekends, so he told us to have a good night and he wished me luck with the rest of my university journey. 
He gave me a hug and gave my mother a hug and a slight kiss while moving his hand towards her bum, which she found weird and brushed it off as nothing. My mom is 37 years old but looks young for her age, and Jeremy is easily in his 40s, so we just kind of thought Jeremy may have fancied his chances with her. Moving on. Me and my mom have a great night around the town and watch a couple of live bands, and we have a few glasses of wine so we're a little on the tipsy side. We get back to the hotel and the bar is still open, so we decide to have a nightcap. Whilst we're having a drink in the bar, Jeremy emerges from a back room and spots us and makes a couple of jokes. Jeremy then proceeds to watch a video on his phone on full volume of a woman screaming at the top of her lungs as if she was being murdered. The screaming was absolutely blood curdling and it absolutely made me and my mom completely unsettled. And there was also another couple in the bar that looked a little concerned as well. The video went on for another three to four minutes before Jeremy laughed and went into the back. When we make our way to the bed, my mom had taken her shoes off after they had become painful, which was from dancing in the bars from earlier. Jeremy emerges from the back room and puts his arm around my mom and then says, Oh, let me help you to your room, honey. You must be wasted after all of that drinking. Now, my mom isn't actually that drunk and insists that she's fine. But Jeremy just persists and basically follows us to our room and then proceeds to come in. But I bid him good night and I pretty much close the door right in his face before locking it. The next morning, we're up early and we make our way down for breakfast. The girl working takes our breakfast order, only for Jeremy to bring them out, insisting the eggs cook to perfection. Although, he claimed he never worked on weekends. Me and my mom are thoroughly weirded out by Jeremy at this stage, and we check out straight after breakfast. Jeremy sees us out, and then he says these exact words. I'll be seeing you very soon, Christy. Christy was my mother's name. Anyway. At the time, it didn't really strike us as unusual, and my mom just drives us to my new home and helps me unpack and stuff. She helps me to unpack and then leaves in the early afternoon, as she had to work that evening in our local bar. The rest of the day goes by without much of anything really going on, but that night, I'm out drinking with my housemates, and I get a call from my mom saying that Jeremy had just come into the bar where she works. This is no coincidence. When we were having our nightcap, Jeremy would have heard us talking about the bar where my mom works, and he also had our address which needed to be provided at the hotel for whatever reason. He had also said to my mom when she was pouring his pint that she should go around to his friend's house after her shift, which was just around the corner. This call really scared the crap out of me. About a half an hour later, my mom called me and said that Jeremy had left the bar after she rejected his offer to go to his friend's house later. But Jeremy had said to her that he'd be back for her later. This was really concerning, and I told her to make sure that there was a customer with her, as she was locking up on her own that evening. After this call, I felt absolutely sick, and I didn't join my friends in going to the nightclubs. In the meantime, I decided to call my dad, who no longer speaks to my mom. They aren't on bad terms, they just choose to not keep in contact with each other after they split a few years ago. My dad is a club bouncer, but he wasn't on duty that night. But I decided to call him and absolutely begged him just to drive down there and make sure everything was okay with my mom. My dad could clearly tell by my shaky voice that I was panicked, scared, and absolutely helpless. 1am rolled around and I didn't really get a response from either my mom or my dad's phone. I was worried sick and I hoped that Jeremy hadn't been waiting around a corner and done something to my mom when she was locking up. At 1.30am, my mom finally rings me in hysterics. As she had been locking up, Jeremy had pulled up in a car with three other men and then shouted at her to get into the car for a ride. My mom declined his advances and he got out of the car and then approached her and told her that he won't tell her again. He said that she had been flirting with him and teasing him ever since she checked in last night. She told Jeremy that it's complete bullcrap and that she wasn't into him. As Jeremy got closer to her, she could smell heavy liquor. 
As Jeremy went in to grab my mom, my dad pulls up behind the car and then beeps his horn. This causes Jeremy to go back into the car and climb back in, and then he tells my mom that he knows where she lives and he'll be waiting. The car screeches off and my dad gets out of his car and then tells my mom that I had told him to go check on her. Scared to go home, she asked my dad to drop her off at my grandmother's as she really didn't want to be alone that night. After that night, we never saw Jeremy ever again, but my mom did make a report to the police about him and gave them a full account of what had happened, but she never heard back from them. I'm just so relieved that my dad turned to the pub when he did as Jeremy could have easily been able to get my mom into that car as she's only very small in stature, about 5 foot 2 and 120 pounds. I just really hope that scumbag got what was coming to him and is behind bars now. My mom was pretty badly affected by this and only now is she comfortable being alone in her house. So Jeremy, wherever the hell you are, please stay away from us and definitely stay away from my mom. Hey everyone, thank you for taking the time to listen to today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you have your own personal scary story or experience, be sure to submit them to my website at southerncannibal.com. Stay safe everyone, and remember to always Stay hungry.